Hi guys, Mark here from Sea Wild Earth, and today I want to speak to you about focus stacking. Now, what is focus stacking? It's a technique used predominantly by macro photographers and product photographers. Uh, and what it is, is <clears throat> with, when you're shooting macro photography, you're very limited with regards to your depth of field because of the closeness with which you're shooting your subject. Okay, uh, and so what we do is we adopt a technique called focus stacking, where we take a number of different images, uh, and each one with the focus uh, point moved uh, through the image, uh, overlapping each focal uh, focal um, plane uh, of each image, and then eventually, when we come to Photoshop or an editing software, we lump all of those together, taking only the in focus areas of each shot. And then at the end of the day, we're left with an image that has basically the whole depth of the um, subject that we're shooting clear for the viewer to see. Um, it's something that you cannot accomplish in one shot, even with a, a very large uh, aperture, or very closed aperture, sorry, um, just simply because of the physics of the proximity and the focal length that you're using. Okay, um, today, I'll take you through a few pieces of equipment, um, and I must just say at this juncture, um, none of the manufacturers that I'm going to mention now uh, have paid me to say anything about their products, promote it, say good things about it, whatever, okay? There is no sponsor on this video, it's just gear that I've got, um, but I'll tell you what it is, and I'll link it all below in the comments as well, okay? Now, lenses, macro lenses. Normally, like this one here, fantastic lens by the way, it's the Tamron 90mm uh, f2.8. This is the first generation, they've since come out with the second generation. Stunning, stunning optic and very, very good results. Okay, um, but this uh, lens, like any other dedicated macro lens, will only allow you to shoot up to a maximum of 1 to 1 macro ratio. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, a one-to-one -one ratio is where you would duplicate on a full-frame sensor the actual life-size uh, replication of what it is that you're shooting. So if, say for example, I want to shoot the, the eye of a fly, one-to-one um, -one macro ratio will allow me to duplicate that fly's eye at life-size on the sensor, on the imaging sensor, okay? That is the, uh, the what is the macro ratio. If I wanted to shoot any larger than that, or any with any greater uh, magnification, I do have another option. That's this little guy here. Let's just take this uh, cover off. Okay, so we've got our lens. This is the Raynox M250. All right, now this, it's got a little pinch area here, or pinch clips here. Okay, all I do is pinch those together, put it on the front of the lens, let them go, and there we are, we've got another, magnifying element in front of our lens okay now be wary if you do have one of these or if you do want to use one of these is that the edges of your images are not going to be tremendously sharp okay so make sure that you compose your image knowing that you're going to crop the large part of the set of the middle of the image where it's sharpest you're going to crop that out at the end of the day okay but a very cheap option for additional macro uh, photography or magnification when you're shooting a standard one-to-one -one lens. Okay, let's just put these out of the way. Job done. Okay, now if you wanted to get larger or closer than one-to-one -one, uh, macro ratio, you can always find something like this. Now this is the Lauer 60 millimeter f2.8 2-to-1, uh, and as the name suggests, it, it allows you to focus or to, to magnify down to a macro ratio of two to one. So you can double the size of whatever it is that you're photographing onto the imaging sensor, okay? So that fly's eye or these bulbs or these water bubbles or whatever, they're absolutely microscopic uh, and you can only accomplish this at about two to one. It's called uh, refraction, okay? You can only accomplish that from two to one. So this is the lens that I would use for something like that, okay? That allows me to go to two to one. Now, both of these lenses, the Lauer, I believe, is 600 bucks, right? The Tamron, cheaper is still, I think is about 400 bucks for the generation or the first generation, if you can still get them, because I believe they're discontinued now. Uh, but if you can find a good second-hand one, uh, don't expect to pay any more than about two, 300 bucks for it, okay? Um, the second generation, not too sure how much that is, but again, I'll link to that in the description below. 
Now, today, I'm going to be shooting with something that is not the easiest of lenses to work with. I'm going to be using the Canon MPE 65. Okay, here it is here. Uh, and it is a monster of a lens. Most of the images that you can see revolving on my screensaver here were filmed with, or were photographed, sorry, uh, with this lens here. Now, we've touched on the fact that these lenses, lenses allow you to shoot at one-to-one -one and two-to-one. Well, so does this lens. It starts at one-to-one. -one. It's a dedicated macro telescope, okay? And just with a flick or with a turn of the hand on the zoom ring, it takes you up to two times life size. Okay, or two to one macro ratio. Twist again, we go to three to one. Twist again, we go to four to one, and do a final twist, and it gets you up to a mind-bending five to one macro ratio, which means five times life size on the sensor. So, absolutely the tiniest thing that you can imagine, you can photograph that at five times its life size, and put it on a sensor in order to present that as one photograph to your viewers. How awesome is that? So you can do like the, the patterns on a on a butterfly's wings or even just the, the proboscis of a, of a butterfly, if a butterfly lets you get that close. Um, because the downside to using a lens like this is the fact that you're going to have to get very, very close to your subject. Um, and if you're photographing uh, wildlife, um, then you need to have wildlife that is either distracted by something like a food source, like bees in a flower, okay, or you maybe it's dead and you want to just photograph its skeleton or, or the fact that it's dead or whatever, um, or otherwise it just needs to be very, very tolerant to your presence. Uh, a large part of the time when you're photographing wildlife at, at a microscopic level like this, these guys are obviously... Uh, <laughs> predisposed disposed with uh, creating mini weevils. Um, the downside to photographing uh, wildlife is that it tends to be very skittish. Um, and when you are trying to get macro shots of wildlife, what invariably happens is you'll spend 10 minutes crawling up and getting into, into position, ready to photograph, and then you'll just make one final movement adjustment, and that will be enough for that insect to take flight or to just leg it. So very, very frustrating it can be. Uh, but this will give you an idea of the working distances that are required in order to work with this particular lens. Now I need to put my glasses on, unfortunately. Uh, a lifetime spent behind the lens uh, certainly uh, has play, takes its toll on the old peepers. Anyway, here we go. So at one to one on the MPE 65, my working distance, and that is between the end of the lens and the subject, is 101 millimeters or four inches. Okay. Um, so that doesn't sound too bad, but when you take it up then to 2 to 1 macro ratio, you drop that working distance down to 63 millimeters or 2.5 um, inches. Once we get to 3 to 1, you're looking at 51 millimeters or what is it, 2 inches. Uh, if we go then to 4 to 1, you're looking at 44 millimeters, 1 1.7 uh, inches. And finally, at 5 to 1, you're looking at 41 millimeters or 1.6 inches. So if we are photographing anything at 5 to 1, you need your subject to be about here. So if you're thinking about uh, a fly or a beetle or a bug or, or any animal that's living, in order to be able to get that close, that animal needs to be incredibly tolerant, as I said, or it needs to be just predisposed, predisposed with eating, mating like we saw earlier on, or any other behavioural trait that's going to keep its mind off of your approach, bearing in mind also that there's a big flash system on this as well, um, in order to get the shot. So you've got to be very, very lucky in order to get some of these shots. Uh, but as you persevere, then luck will shine on you. Okay. Now, beyond this equipment that I'm using, or beyond the lens that I'm using, there are some other uh, equipment um, considerations, and those are as follows. Uh, in order to make such microscopic uh, advances in distance between each focal plane, I prefer to use what is called a macro slider, and that's this contraption here. Um, and what you've got are two carriages, one this way and one this way, uh, sitting on top of each other, and you've got these two controls uh, at the top and at the bottom, uh, that control the behavior of this of the sled because this is basically a sled the camera sits in here uh, And what I can do I can control lateral movement, which is left and right by this uh, By this uh, knob here. Okay by turning that the carriage is going to go left and right 
and by turning this one at the bottom then the carriage is going to be transported uh, transported either forwards or backwards okay um, so there you go that's the one that I'm interested in today uh, because I'm going to get set up okay um, so that the camera is at one to one um, but it's going to be very close to the to the um, to the subject everything in focus with the rack at the very back okay so we're going to travel through the image from front to back just using this transport rod or this transport carriage carrying the camera backwards and forwards or just forwards okay awesome okay now beyond that I'm going to be firing a off camera flash which in today's case is the Godox AD200 and to fire that I'm using this X1T stroke C for Canon uh, trigger okay so that will just sit on my camera and then finally I'm going to be using this this is the Myox trigger it is a multi-functioning uh, trigger I made a video about it earlier on you know, about two years ago I think <laughs> uh, but you can see that up there uh, and this will allow me to connect my smart device uh, and trigger my camera with my smart device so I don't need to touch the camera uh, touching the camera when we're at such high magnification obviously has the potential to induce shake and shake is going to um, create the potential for blurry images and we don't want that when we're macro uh, focus stacking okay so what's going to happen now I'm going to go and get set up uh, and once I'm set up uh, I'll take you through the gear show you how I shoot and once I finish shooting I'll very quickly come back to the computer and we'll go through how we edit and how we process the, um, the macro stack uh, using Photoshop it's an automated process so it happens very very quickly uh, and once that's done you'll be all set to go out and try focus stacking for yourselves so let's go and get set up sounds like a plan okay well here we are we're set up uh, I've got the camera on the uh, macro slider uh, on top of the camera we have the um, we've got the, the trigger for the flash which the Godox flash is just here I've got a, a beauty dish on it with a diffuser uh, and on top of the trigger for the flash we have the Myops trigger which will allow me to connect my smart device to that trigger and then that negates me having to use the uh, the shutter cable or the shutter release uh, so because I don't want to shake the uh, shake the element uh, shake the camera okay um, so in order to link up my my ops all I do is I turn it on okay from there I'll go up into what I call pixel therapy which is all of my um, apps that I use on my smart device relative to photography um, go into the app for the my ops trigger and it should pick it up it's got its own little Wi-Fi network tap on that scroll and here you can see all of the different uh, trigger scenarios that you can use this trigger for it's an excellent piece of git like I said earlier on uh, check out the uh, video that's linked up here okay scroll all the way down and here you've got cable release so quite simply all I need to do is tap on there and now every time I tap the uh, screen there but simply take a shot there we go now you'll see that the subject that we're shooting is that drawing pin I've got the system set up so that without or so that the on the very back of the um, macro sled at the moment the very absolute tip of the um, of the of the pin is in focus and so all I need to do now is just travel through incrementally little steps one by one uh, take a shot uh, so that we have a, a number of images all with different focal uh, planes uh, on the pin and then afterwards in Photoshop we'll just join all of those together so that we have an image just of hopefully the, the pin uh, in clear view all the way from the tip of the pin to the uh, back uh, to the back end of it okay so let's go ahead and do that now Normally, if you're working on a bug or something like that, I found that about um, between four and six images are your max. Okay, so there we go, we're done. We've travelled all the way through the length of this pin from the absolute pin tip all the way through to the tail. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take all of the images and we're going to go and see how we do the edit. Okay? Let's see how that goes. Hey okay, guys, well I've taken the photographs and so now what we need to do is we need to jump into Photoshop and I'll show you just exactly how we edit and it's not as difficult as you would think. All right, so now that we're in Photoshop, uh, this is what we do. Okay, so all we do is we go up to File, and you'll see up here it's got an automated or an automate uh, option. Um, you come down to the very bottom, and you have Photo Merge. Click onto that. Okay, now you come out with this uh, Photo Merge dialog box here. Okay, so we leave it on Auto. We unclick the blend images together. And then what we do is we go and we browse for the photographs that we wish to stack. Okay, so we go to browse. That brings up then a menu selection or a, a box that allows me to uh, pins. Here we go. And we're going to go to J pins. There we go. Now I've already taken the luxury and uh, converted all of these to low resolution JPEGs just to speed up the whole process. And for the shoot, we actually came up with 25 images. So it's going to be quite an extensive uh, stack. Okay, but I like to be try and be precise. And what that's going to do now, that is now going to create all of the layers that will be used in the stack. Okay, so this may take a bit of a while, but you just have to let Photoshop do its thing uh, and build all of those layers. Well, whilst this is uh, loading, folks, what I can do is just take a moment just to show you some of the images that I've accomplished in the past uh, using the focus stacking technique. So please enjoy. Well, now that all of the uh, layers uh, have been aligned or have been loaded, what we then do is we just quite simply shift, click, and select all of the layers. Okay, so all of the layers that we've got in our right hand navigation or in our right hand bar are selected. Okay, and then we go to up to here to edit, auto blend layers. And then we go to Stack Images, Seamless Tones and Colors. We press OK. And what's going to happen now is that Photoshop's going to do its magic. And it's just going to select each one of the areas of focus from each image and put them all, compile them all into a final image. OK, and that again, it's a process that's going to take a bit of time because there are 25 uh, component images uh, in this shot. Uh, but once it's done, we'll come back and we'll check it out. Well, now that all of the um, all of the layers have been combined, you, you're presented with the final image. And as you can see, we do have an image. It's a little bit dirty at the moment. It needs cleaning up, uh, and I'll do that a bit later on. Uh, but as you can see here, we've got um, the absolute front end of the pin, uh, okay, in lovely clear focus, and all the way through to the back of the pin. Uh, it, again, the whole thing in nice clear focus. All right, um, now what you will notice is that the edges, because the images had to shift um, as each layer or each focal area of each layer has been adjusted onto the image, it shifted because of the movement of the camera on the um, slider. 
Um, the image here, the edges are a bit deteriorated. So all you do um, from that is you just take an area. First off, you need to just combine everything. So um, up here you can go to uh, Merge Visible, or you can even go to Flatten, okay, if you want to flatten, but that's then going to lock the image. Um, now we've just got one single layer, okay, um, and all you can do then is just crop the area that you want to keep of your image, okay, I think that's fair enough. Uh, there's a lot of dead space, so we can actually make it a little bit smaller and then just drag that mask, ooh, okay, drag that mask over, okay, to re retain the image that we want, okay. And it's still, because of the resolution of this camera, um, if I was working in RAW, it would still be huge, uh, but we're still left with an image, uh, in this case, which is more than enough for this exercise. Okay, so let's just go ahead and uh, crop that. And there's our final image. Okay, uh, I'm gonna clean this up a little bit uh, and I'll put it in again at the end of the film. Okay, so that's pretty much uh, your focus stacking exercise. Uh, then all we need to do is just simply go ahead and uh, save this image. So I'm just gonna go save as. I'll chuck it on the desktop, easy place to locate it. Uh, and then just call it pin. There we go, and I'm gonna save it as a JPEG. Again, just to save time and effort. Okay, and save. So maximum quality. Okay, job done. So there you have it, that was focus stacking. Relatively simple, right? So hopefully you can now go out and uh, you know, shoot this type of imaging for yourselves. If you do, be sure to share the uh, results in the comments, put a link in there, no problem. I'll go and have a look and I'll, when I can, I'll be able to give my uh, constructive feedback on your results, all good. And just one thing before I go, uh, folks, um, for anyone who might be interested, um, my background is as a wildlife cameraman. I spent many, many years uh, filming underwater um, and I continue to shoot and photograph and film uh, wildlife as and whenever I can. Um, now, in the description, uh, you'll find a link to a newly created Patreon. Uh, and the Patreon is a, an account, it's, it's, it's a network that allows um, your followers, if they're so motivated, um, to support you with a very small up to them monthly fee uh, in order for creative artists to concentrate on creating content. Um, now, other than what I do on this channel here, um, some of you may have seen a film that I made about an island close to us called Iriomote. There's a link to it up here. Um, now, on Iriomote, for me, there is a, a massive challenge and it's something that no one in the world has ever done before. Uh, there is a known wild cat that inhabits the jungle, uh, and it's a cat called the Yamaneko. It's probably about the size of a regular domestic cat, about this big. Um, but beyond that, there, since about the 1950s, uh, there's been a about 49 eyewitness um, accounts of um, interactions with a cat that is called not the Yamaneko or, or wild mountain cat but it's called the Yamapicaria. Um, I don't know what that means in the local dialect uh, but that is the name that's been given to it and by all accounts and by all um, descriptions of what this cat is it could be a clouded leopard. Now nobody has ever ever filmed or photographed this thing um, but I want to do that. I want to go, I want to fly, it's about a 40 minute flight from here, um, <clears throat> and then a, a boat ride. And you'll see in the video, if you take a look, that the majority of the island is, is really thick jungle. Um, now it's my idea, or what I want to try and do, having spoken to biologists who study clouded leopards, they've described to me the um, terrain that these cats normally have in their, in their territory. Uh, and I've identified four locations in, in, in the island that has very low population anyway, but I've, I've identified four locations with zero human population 
and my idea is to go and spend a month in the jungle um, and I want to make a film about it. I want to go and see if there's something uh, in the jungles that nobody has ever seen before. Uh, and if there is, I want to try and identify it, um, not just for me, but uh, more, more importantly for science, uh, just so that uh, we have an idea of, of what is where and, and what animal it could be. So um, I've set up a Patreon page uh, that hopefully I'm trying to, to get enough of an audience there that will allow me to try and raise the funds in order to go and initially do that one month in the jungle. Uh, and my idea after that, if I do film or photograph it, is to try and then find a proper budget to, to, to go there and try and film it properly. Now, whether that takes a year, two years, three years, four years, whoever knows, however, however long, uh, I don't know. Uh, but that's going to be, for me, uh, a project that... Um, is, is going to be my, my goal, is to try and do something that no one's ever done before and uh, hopefully with the support of some of my audience uh, that may become a reality. So uh, please if you are so minded to support that effort um, please take a look at my Patreon, the link's in the comments. Uh, but beyond that, focus stacking folks, I hope you have a blast with it. Please do share your images and I'll see you very soon. Alright guys, take care.